Hello, and welcome to the Science Fiction and Fantasy Marketing Podcast, the show where we help you establish your author brand, increase the size of your audience, and sell more books. I'm Lindsay Baroker, and I'm here with my co-hosts. I'm Jeff Poole. And I'm Joe Lalo. And we've got a guest for you this week, Russell Nolte. Nolte? Russell, I should ask you how to pronounce your name. <laughs> it's Nolte. It's like Nick Nolte, but spelled Nolte. differently. Nolte. Got it. All right. I'm a notoriously mangling guest names as usual, so you're in the right place. And we're going to be talking about selling paperback books today, kind of working the convention circuit to do so, and when print runs can actually make sense. You know, I know we've heard a lot of people talking about how you used to have to have 5,000 books in your garage, and we're going to find out if there is a reason you would want to do that these days. But our guest, Russell, has been writing since he was a zygote, which was kind of awkward for his mother, but she got over it. He's written film, TV animation, comic books, and novels. He has a variety of science fiction, fantasy, and adventure novels out, and recently published Sell Your Soul, How to Build Your Creative Career. And he also used to host the Business of Art podcast that was about helping creatives build better businesses. Uh, today, as we kind of hinted at, he's making his living on the convention circuit, selling at 30 to 40 conventions a year. And uh, interestingly, very little of his income comes from Amazon, which, as we've talked about before, people are always looking for ways to not rely so heavily on them. So I hope you guys will find the show interesting. Uh, Russell, well, you've got a pretty eclectic background there. Why don't you tell us a bit about yourself and how you got into all this? Sure. So uh, I moved out to L.A. about 11 years ago now. No, sorry, almost 10 years ago now. Um, but before then, I lived in D.C. and I uh, wrote a movie, directed a movie, um, and it just took a long time. Passion was writing. Uh, I came out to L.A. in 2008 and tried to still shop movies and television stuff around. But again, it takes a long time to do. And what I really love is telling stories. So in 2010, my manager at the time asked me if I wanted to get into comics and if I ever thought about comics. And I said, of course not. Like, I don't read superheroes, nor do I care about superheroes. And plus, like, I'm not going to go back and read 50 years of comics to catch up. And he's, he handed me a stack of independent comics, uh, things from Devil's Do and uh, First Comics and just a bunch of indie stuff that he had sitting around his office. And I read all of them. And they were all beautiful and wonderfully done. And they were as good or better than anything I'd ever read in Marvel or DC. And so I went back to him and I said, why haven't you ever told me about comics before? You about it since literally we, I started working with you. Um, and I just started doing comics and then from doing comics. And uh, it was very easy for me to transition from a visual storytelling medium like movies to a visual storytelling medium like comics. Um, but while I was doing comics, it still took a long time. And I had stories that I wanted to tell. I started writing novels. And I had no idea how to write a novel at the time. So I decided I would write a very simple novel. And to write a very simple novel, um, I wrote a book called Gumshoe's Case of Madison's Father, which is a middle grade fiction. And I'm not saying that middle grade novels are not complicated, but the sentence structure tends to be less complicated than an adult novel. So I really have been very good at trying to figure out like the max of my ability and then writing to that. The second book that I wrote was a told all in blog posts. I've been writing blogs since 2007. So it was a mystery novel to all in blog posts because I knew what that structure. And then once I had that middle grade fiction novel and my blog post book, I started writing novels and then growing from there. And I really, as much as I love comics and movies and TV, love the idea of me being able to take something in my head and, and it being the final product. It's scary, much scarier than in movies, TV, or, or animation or comics. But there is a satisfaction that every word you write and every turn you make is a choice that you have made. And that connection with the audience, it's really hard to top. And then you don't have to wait for anybody else for it to be done. <laughs> Maybe cover art that's been slowing a couple of us down. But I can imagine if you're done with a story having to wait a year or whatever but while the cover artist or the illustrator for the comics finishes things could be frustrating if you're not a patient person, which I am not. 
yeah, it takes about two years to make a comic. It takes about our my the, when from finishing the movie that we made to it coming out took six years. Now a book can take. I mean, you could finish a book and release it in two weeks, but at least three to six months, you can get a book out and churn that out, which is way quicker than anything I've ever done before. Awesome. And, uh, you know, in looking at your kind of backlist on Amazon, I noticed that you're kind of in a lot of little different genre niches and not really any one long series, as we often advise on the show. But uh, I understand the artist wanting to just do whatever excites you too. Is that, have you had any strategy or are you just kind of writing what is exciting to you? So I, when I first started, uh, I, I heard a lot of people say that your first 10 things are going to suck. And so my goal was to write 10 things as quick as humanly possible, about all sorts of genres, styles, tones, and find out what I really liked. So from those 10, about eight of them really stunk, but a couple of mystery novels came out of it. Um, Ichabod Jones' Monster Hunter came out of it. Katrina Hates Dead, The Dead came out of it. And, they, and Spaceship Broken came out of it. And these were all scripts before they were, before I, I transitioned them into, into comics or, uh, or novels. So uh, when you're writing a movie script, there's a little more freedom with the, the tone and the style and like what you can try. So my first 10 books look like a big mishmash of stuff. But from doing that, trying to get an audience what they liked and what I really liked to write. To write. So uh, I mostly write urban fantasy and space fantasy now, and that's what my career is gonna, trajectory is gonna go towards. But I really, enjoyed writing in every genre because I absolutely know what I love to write and more than what I love to write, what I am good at and how to incorporate elements from different genres into one story. All right. Um, so it seems like, you know, uh, you've found what we sort of recommend on the show in terms of writing to market is finding the balance of what your market wants and what you write well. Uh, when you're deciding what your next thing is going to be, is it ever just marketing based where it's like, well, this has been selling well, I'll write another one of those, or is it still sort of, you have a story you're into telling and that's what you write next? So my audience determines everything that I write. Um, I survey my audience a lot and a lot of that comes from shows. Uh, almost all of it is based on what they tell me. And this is one of the great benefit of shows literally be face to face with the human being and see what lights them up as opposed to a cold survey across the internet where you don't have information but you don't have that visceral reaction just tell what my audience wants because you there's almost a moment of their breath being taken away by something that you say by talking to them about building and all of the stuff that i didn't write in my original novels what pieces will interest them. And as my audience grows, uh, it just becomes more and more apparent what they want. So what I like to do is have a bunch of ideas that I'm kind of kicking around and see what is the thing that's lighting them up. So I'm not writing to any market out there on Amazon, but I am writing to the thousands of people that are in my audience and finding out what they want and assuming that if I can get a few thousand people to really dig what I'm doing, then it will translate to many, many more sales in the future. All right. I, my question for you is, as, as I was going through your list of books and checking out you know, the different titles you have available, you've got quite a variety of, of selections to choose from. So I have to ask you, where do you draw your inspiration from? Um, so my inspiration comes from the characters. So I generally work from character first. Most of my books are a character study. And I like, I have a pretty simple philosophy. I wanna take a character I, and I don't write a lot of stuff down. So I, I put them in the back of my brain until I keep coming back again and again and again and again and again. And until they, my brain sort of develops them as a character. And I have a theory that if they don't keep coming back enough, then it's not worth writing them yet. So I have characters that are kind of in the back of my brain and have been noodling around for years. And 
I have some that immediately jump forward in three months. And what ends up happening is they start annoying me until I write them down. And then my goal is to take a character that I've already developed and find out what they hate most in the world or what will put them in the most conflict and then do that to them over and over and over and over again because conflict is what grows story. So every time that they get over a piece of a conflict, it gets worse and worse and worse and worse for them. And uh, it's been a pretty interesting uh, when I tell people about it. It's not how most people write, but I have found that if I just start with the character and then put them in the worst situation humanly possible and then gleefully uh, am masochist, sadistic to them, then things end up enjoying that. And that's where the most conflict comes from. And that's where the characters grow the most. So that by the end of the story, they are much different than how they started. Have you based any of your characters off of real life people? Like for instance, you're standing in Starbucks line and the lady in front of you either can't make up her mind or whatnot. You're looking at her going, oh, you just made it to the next book, lady. You're going to be dragon fodder by the end of the scene. I just kind of want to, I've done a few things like that. So I was wondering if you do too. I don't generally do that. I do base characters off experience that I've had. So in Spaceship Broken, my uh, the the grandfather in that story is based on my grandfather, but I usually stories come from a deep personal place in my the, in the bowels of my soul and something that I need to tell. So the, that character doesn't really annoy me, the person who is in Starbucks. But what does annoy me is like class warfare. Oh, and so my characters are more about like religion and politics and God and things that I've been struggling with in my own life, not so much a single human. All right. I have to say that I think that's a great place to start a story is to start with the character and then, you know, what can I do to this person to make life tough for them? I, you know, I feel like I've read a lot of books from newer authors where they don't want to, it's like, they don't want to be cruel to their character and it's just kind of a boring story. So it sounds like you're creating really gripping stories with your style. Yeah, I, I will say that one of the great things about me having a failed career as a movie and TV writer for a lot of years before I even started doing novels was I have all of those stories too, where not a lot of stuff happens, but they're in scripts that no one is ever going to see instead of novels, which I can monitor, which, which I could theoretically monetize. It's tough to love a character that's a part of you and put them through pain and misery. But it is also, if we look at our own lives or the best historical fiction or even the best nonfiction, the things that really resonate with us and change us are the conflicts, not when things are going well. So you're almost doing a disservice to your character by not putting them in conflict because that is how they're going to grow and be a better person than they are now at the beginning of your story. Yeah, very good point. Well, let's jump into how you're actually selling all these books at these conventions, because uh, <laughs> it's something none of the three of us really do much of. And I've heard from authors that do well selling books at conventions. And I've even told other authors, like at the 20 Books Conference, I was like, well, I heard from somebody that sold really well at their local Comic Con. And the author was like, oh, Comic Con's horrible. Don't go there to sell books. So it seems like different people have really different experiences. So I guess what I should ask is, what is the secret to actually selling books at the conventions? So I, I wrote a couple of things down as far as what a convention can do for you before we even get into how to sell the books. So um, the thing that I love most about a convention is that it allows you to stand out from a crowd. So we are all on Amazon, and some of us are wide, some of us are not. Some of us have different opinions on Amazon and not, I know. Um, but regardless, Amazon has millions of books that launch a year. It's very hard to stand out in that environment. When you take something into an in-person world, you're going from millions of authors you're competing with to two to 400, maybe 600 at a big convention. At a huge convention, maybe it's a, a thousand or a couple thousand, that is way less than you are competing with on Amazon. 
It is way less than you're competing with anywhere else unless you're at your own book signing. And a convention's job is to bring a ton of people through a door. So that is, I think, the number one thing that you can take away is to be successful, you have to stand out a, 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 above the din of other people. And there's a lot of din. There's a lot of authors, whether your books are great or terrible, if they're on Amazon, generally they are categorized with the other million books. It's very hard to stand out against them. Show, if you go to several shows, you have the ability to stand out because now someone is taking you out of an online space and putting you behind a table and changing their perception of you. Just like the people that are watching, that are listening to me or, or on the live stream with you guys, when you see someone's face, it's a lot different than when you just read their work or see a marketing message for them. Now, that's probably the number one thing that I would have to say about shows. They allow you to stand out from the millions of authors and allow you to work down to just a couple of hundred. And now, no matter what, if you're competing with a couple of hundred people, I will take that all day as opposed to competing with several million. Right? So it's good to me. <laughs> the, the next thing is to make a sale on uh, in person is somewhere between 10 and 100 times easier than making a sale online. Because people are more forgiving in person than they are online. So let's say your book blurb isn't amazing. It might never sell on Amazon, but in person, you might be able, you could get sales from that because people are much more forgiving in person. But more importantly, your book blurb will improve by talking to people about what your book is about. And you will understand the wording that people actually care about when it comes to your book. Tr visceral reaction. When I talk to people about their books, my books, I know the moments that are incredibly important to them and what I should focus on because they do this. <gasps> I'm gonna do that one more time. They, they do this. <gasps> and their eyes light up. You can see it. This is not about surveying your audience. This is not about like talking to them on an instant message. When you see their face, there is no denying whether they are bored or they are excited about the thing that you're doing. Again, we're not even talking about how to sell the thing now. We're just talking about what it can do for you. Even if you sell zero books, it will help you, it will help you stand out from the, from the crowd, especially if you're using a mailing list in conjunction with the people, even if you sell zero books, but get a couple hundred people on your mailing list from that show, effective. And then you will figure out what people like and don't like about your books. Next, you will build authority. Now, there are some dozens of buying triggers. There are six that are really important to making a sale. And one of them is authority. That means people see you as an expert. When you are online, people and against a million people, people don't necessarily see you as an expert. When you are standing behind a table, when, when 90,000 people are going through a hall and there's only 800 behind a table, you are almost immediately buying expert status especially if you compare that with being on a panel. You are taking yourself and, and basically, make, if you play that right, you are, you are able to use the convention's authority. If it's Emerald City Comic Con, which will be at next year, or San Diego Comic Con, they are allowing you to exhibit there. So just because they are cool and you're paying money to get in there, you are by some definition cool as well cool by authority. It's like using doing a group promo or a group giveaway. Um, and finally, what it can do for you is you meet your audience we talked about, but you build the community with the other exhibitors. Now, I don't know about you guys, but aside from making a great book, every great thing that has ever happened in my career came from the people that knew me and trusted me in the community of authors. Now, there's a saying about uh, your, uh, um, success is who you know, but that's not actually accurate. What is accurate is success is who knows you and who trusts you. 
And by being at a convention, you are passing by thousands of people and you are able to build a community with other exhibitors who've also paid to be there and thus are very serious about building their careers. Now, again, these are all things that I, and I wanted to get that out of the way before I actually talk about selling because those are all very powerful things. Even if you make zero sales, that if you fun, that, that if functionally you do them pro, uh, appropriately, you will get something out of a convention. Does that make sense? Yes. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. So how to sell at a convention and how it's different than selling online. I actually brought, for the people that have, are on live video, I have a little uh, demo. But I will just walk it through for the people that are listening on the podcast like I always do. So um, in my right hand, I have my book, Ichabod Jones Monster Hunter, that I sell at shows for $30. On my left hand, I have a my book, uh, Ichabod Jones Monster Hunter, which sells on Amazon for $15 in paperback. These two books are functionally inside the same, but they are very different. This is the one on my right is a convention exclusive. It has a different cover that is meant to draw the eye of somebody at a convention. On Amazon what, or on uh, online, it's good to look like every other book, right? That's kind of like one of the tenets of selling on Amazon. Covers should look like other things in the genre. On, but at a show, it's very different. At a, uh, in a show, you want something that stands out and you want something that is exclusive to the show. It doesn't have to be that show, but something that people can only get at the show because that exclusivity and that scarcity is another one of the buying triggers that will convince somebody to buy. But it will also stand out in the monotony of a show. I was at Denver Comic Con and I went through, they have like an author alley and every book looked the same which is great on Amazon. But when you're trying to convince somebody that your books are different and to stop, you need something that is, that is functionally looking different. So the first thing that you should do is do some sort of exclusive cover that you're only gonna do at shows, which is easy to do on Ingram Spark. You can, uh, you can do a second cover and then upload a second cover. Um, I'm not quite sure if you can do it on CreateSpace, but I know because I do it up for Ingram um, that if you that you can do a second just exclusive cover on Ingram, and I think you can do it on CreateSpace as well. Do you think it's a different audience of people coming to the conventions that like the covers that stand out that for their uniqueness, as opposed to the typical maybe fantasy fan on that is surfing on Amazon and, like you said, is uh, interested in what look similar to other stories they know that they've enjoyed. When people go to a show, what they want is an experience. What you're really selling them is an experience and a memento of the show. So part of your job is to be a good ambassador of the show and to give somebody something that they can't, that they can't get somewhere else. Because what they want, like this, this book, the Ichabod Jones book, becomes a token of the show. It's not just what is inside the pages. It is what they will be able to put on their shelf and say, I got that at this cool show that I went to when I met this cool author who I liked. And then I went back and got all of their backlist on Amazon as well. So one of the other really important things about selling at a convention is you are there to give it to Engage in an experience. You're part of an experience that the show is providing. I do think that people want something a little bit different when it comes to what they're going to buy at a show than what they're going to buy on Amazon. I can I can attest that uh, convention excludes. I was just at PAX Unplugged, and. Uh, they have, I mean, it's a Penny Arcade and they have convention exclusives for every show of various sorts. And some of the people who attended with me basically were only attending so they could get the, the, the convention exclusive. So I know that that's a strong uh, sales tactic. But uh, back to the issue at hand, if you're hoping to be part of a convention, how far ahead should you be pursuing a booth or a panel or just a pass? 
it depends on how big the show is. So at a show like Emerald City Comic Con, I put in my application in March, and and the show, sorry, not March, uh, somewhere around July, for that's in March of this coming year. So the big show is generally six to nine months. And it also depends because there's different levels of show, of, of vendor. So if you want to be an artist alley, usually those are much more competitive and the spaces are cheaper. Vendor booths are much, much more expensive, but they're usually available closer to the show day. Now with the vendor booth, you're going to get a lot more traffic, but you're going to get a lot more cost as well. So while a artist alley booth might be somewhere between 200 to 300 dollars a vendor booth might be somewhere between 750 and 1500 dollars a plan for a big show which are like your anchor shows of the year probably to start planning them six to nine months out and if you get in they will tell you roughly three to six months out and they will open their panels about Four, three to four months out, and it'll give you somewhere around a month to put your panel requests in. So you have to be on top of it. The best thing that you can do at the beginning is try to moderate panels. So find the most popular people that you know and moderate panels, because usually you're not going, if you want to be a go-getter, most people are not going to put you on a panel until you have been on panels. But a smaller show will be able to get you to moderate panels or even do workshops. My first panels and still the most panels I've ever done is at my local convention at Long Beach Comic Con. I've run a dozen plus panels and workshops for them. And then I used that and the people on those panels to leverage myself to other shows. Um, so and a smaller show, you can usually find something a month out. If you really, if you start looking and you should look at your local bookstores and comic shops, if you want to do that, because they're going to have, and libraries, they're going to have an inside track on where the local shows are and other people in, in uh, like artists and creator communities. There's usually always somebody who's in, who's plugged in, in the know, but somewhere between three and six months out, you can really still get, get local shows. Sometimes a week out, you can get really hyper local shows like swap meets and and little shows and swap little swap meets are great because they give you a chance to practice your pitch before you do a big show so when you do one of these shows how many print copies do you typically take of your books with you well i offset print everything that i bring to shows so i have thousands of copies in my garage for books and i bring about a hundred copies of each book now, I do not necessarily think that I'm, I, and I usually sell about half of that at a small table. So, okay, do, do you fly to these conventions? Because I have to ask the inevitable, how much extra on the, you know, to ship these books out to where you're going? So, a, a box, I have hardcover books, a box to ship media mail is $18, roughly between $18 and $20. When I, do, but if you are, if you are, uh, trying to stay cheap, you can bring two check bags for free on Southwest, and you fill those books, those those up with all the books, up to fifty pounds a piece, and bring a hundred pounds of books, uh, a hundred another twenty five pounds in the carry on, and then a backpack with your clothes <laughs> to do it cheap. Now, if you really want the inside trick uh, track to uh, to be cheap, um, or to to not have to, because the big problem with shipping to shows is you have to have somewhere to send the books and all right. you can drive i see like there you can drive all of the time i drive to most of my shows there's only two or three a year that i fly to and it has to be a really big show to fly so i flew to denver and emerald city last year but i drove to phoenix silicon valley and other shows within four hours so a bit, it has to be a massive show for me to even consider flying out to. Um, because I, it's a show that I know I'm going to sell through and be able to pay for a flight, be able to pay for a hotel, and be able to pay for at least inventory. But I normally am not making a lot of money at those big shows, even though I'm making a lot of revenue, because there's such a high cost. 
shipping stuff if you don't want to bring it in carry-ons is to call around to local comic book and bookstores and see if they're willing to do a signing with you the week of the show. And then ask them if they're willing to stock the book or to, for you to have them ship the ship books there before the signing. So maybe two or three weeks before so that the books are already at the store when you get there. And then all you have to do is get them from the store to your hotel. You don't want to necessarily send it to a hotel because they will often pay, charge you per box to store the books, especially in a big city. And if you ship it to the convention, you will have to pay drayage, which is often a couple hundred dollars to have them bring the books to your table. And so in order to prevent that, you can do a little signing and, uh, and most stores want to be involved in a big convention. So they're, there's usually someone you can find that will accommodate you on doing that. Okay. Uh, my next question that I have one from one of our viewers, Monty, he asks, when you select one of your conventions, do you look for a specific theme like Walker Stalker, Game of Thrones, Horror Cons, or, you just, or do you choose something more general? I do different kinds of – so for the first couple of years, I, I did a couple of shows. I'm a big fan of triangulation of what your audience likes. So I did everything from art fairs to – uh, craft shows, I did anime shows and horror shows. I did a whole lot of stuff because I didn't know where my audience was really going to be. But now a couple of years in, I find that my best shows are horror conventions, anime shows and comics shows. Not so much even book shows. Book shows are great for publicity, but they're not great for actually making sales. Um, but those other three conventions and so I focused on those, but I only was able to focus on them because I tried a bunch of these shows and I tried them at a pretty small price point. I didn't just go and do spend $2,000 on an anime show. I did a little anime show here, you know, a local one. And then I did a, a, um, and then I did a little horror convention and these things were a hundred, a couple hundred dollar investments. And I saw that it worked and then I moved up from there. And then I always sell at big shows, but I do very well at big shows because I am a big personality. So small shows actually often are better for more introverted people because you can make a real connection with people. So this is the big difference between a big show and a small show. A small show, the advantage is you're not gonna get a lot of people through the door. A hyper-targeted person and everybody you talk to, is it going to be a potential to buy? So, you know, I generally find that I need to talk to someone for three to five minutes in order for them to potentially buy from me. So I wanna make sure that I talk to as many people as possible and knowing that they're not all going to buy, I'm going to spend as much time as possible with that person. And a small show allows me to do that. At a big show, it's very much a meat market. It's just, you're gonna make more money because you're showing it to so many people, there's so many people stopping by, you can't make that connection. So I like to have big shows and small shows, and I actually cut my teeth with smaller shows because it allowed me to see how my audience wanted me to react and talk to them. I mean, I'm not cursing a lot now, but I generally curse a lot with my audience because they enjoy that. It's as a pattern interrupt, like that's like a signal to them. But there are different, and every audience has different signals how they like being talked to. So being at a show and talking to a lot of allowed me, again, triangulate the kind of person that I was targeting and the kind of person that, that I wanted to talk to and how they wanted to be spoken to and about what. It taught me what kind of words to use, what kind of phrasing to use, what kind of language, um, like what kind of even different kind of accents that they used so that I would know exactly when I transitioned that online sale to, to uh, that offline sale to online sale, I would know exactly the kind of thing that they liked to talk about. And I could make my, my emails engaging, I could make my blurbs engaging and everything 
could signal to the right person so that I could scale what I did offline online. All right, and then you mentioned how you like being a big personality. So my next viewer question is from Kevin who asks, do you ever dress up in costumes at the con while standing at your booth to draw attention to said booth? I do. Uh, I usually, at, usually at LA Comic Con, um, there is a picture of me dressed as the banana doing the peanut butter and jelly time dance. Uh, there is a, uh, there are pictures of me dressed as monks and stuff. I don't do it often um, because I've developed like myself into a personality. So, and like, a, so I don't, I, I don't dress up, but I know a lot of people that are even, that are also introverted, especially introverted people. They, uh, they have uh, cosplayers come to their booth. One thing that is really cool that you can do as far as an exclusive cover is to work with a cosplayer or someone who's going to be at the convention to do an exclusive like photo shoot of your character and bring them to the booth and charge a premium for that book and to have them sign it at the booth or something like that. Like Again, it's about making it an experience. So I have dressed up, but probably not mostly to have fun and not to draw attention to the booth. But there is a way to strategically do that so that you can use it to actually draw more eyeballs. See, I'm thinking as an introvert, I could wear a Darth Vader costume. They couldn't tell who I was. It'd be nice and safe back there behind the mask. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, I love your tip about ship finding a bookstore nearby that you can do a signing at and uh, shipping your books to it. That seems like a, a great tip. And I don't know if I've ever noticed you know, when I've gone to bookstores and seen author signings, now I'm wondering, I wonder if they had a convention that weekend. Uh, <laughs> they were just trying to have a place to ship their books to. Yeah, and a lot of people then stay for a couple of days after and then go to all of the bookstores and try to make a connection. So if you're traveling to a city, a lot more than just the convention out of it. So that's one of the, you know, you're paying three to $500 to get to a city, depending on the time of year, plus hotels. So you either want to go going a couple of days before is a great way to uh, to be able to meet with the retailers in that city, set up a signing. Maybe if you and if you're driving to do signings in the cities that you're driving through. So there are a lot of people that drive from L.A. where I'm from up to Emerald City, which is in Seattle, and they stop in Portland and do signings in Seattle. One of the other great things about uh, if you know you're going to be back at a show almost all the retailers in the city will be at that convention with a table or with a vendor booth. So you can go to those retailers and try to make a connection with them right now. You can either leave, um, it, depending on the retailer, you'll know if they're going to do uh, consignment copies or not, but you can definitely make a connection to send them PDFs later. So you can kind of build your retailer presence. And we got into, I think we're up a little over 80 stores now using that strategy. Yeah, that sounds like a great tip. Um, it, it seems like it's just about you deciding if you want to go to a convention. Are you finding that they're open to anybody or is there still a, a bias that they want more traditionally published authors? Or, or is it just if you have the money, you can buy a booth and that's it? Well, it depends on the show. So there are shows that are curated. So San Diego Comic-Con is curated uh, for small press. So that means everybody has to submit in, in, in July. Um, everyone has to submit a new book that was published within that calendar year or the year or the, or by the time of the show. So let's say this year, it has to be either released in 2018 or 19 and they have to submit that book. And then a jury selects places like Emerald city, uh, New York comic con C2E2, uh, fan expo that are quote unquote lottery systems, but like they seem to check before they actually, they're not like straight lotteries because many people get in from the same uh, over time. And then there are shows like uh, Small Press Expo that are straight lotteries. Like literally you don't know who's getting in every year. They, they, they invite a small number, I think 20 to 25% of people might get an invitation, but most of the people are straight, just drawn from a lottery. Those are the exception to the rule. Usually, if you have money and you get in early enough, you can get a table no matter what. Now, I mean, 
a lot of these tables are expensive. So you want to be judicious with what you're paying and where you're going. For instance, we have a table at Silicon Valley. It costs almost $400. I could do 10 shows in Los Angeles for that same price and maybe get more out of it. Except that I over, I don't, you don't want to oversaturate one market after a long time. So, and you want to open new markets. So you have to kind of work that out. But most shows, if you have the money, you just pay. All right, that's good to know. And do you find that the actual attendees, are they biased at all? They just like they want to see their favorite authors, or are they really pretty open to talking to everybody that's there and maybe buying your books? I would say about 10% of people at any show are actually interested in small press, which is why it's so important to find a show that has a lot of attendees and has a history a history of press people like Emerald City, San Diego, WonderCon, um, other one, Denver, Phoenix. The, um, so one thing that I will say is most people will not buy the first time they see you. Statistically across the board, most people will not buy the first time they see you. As marketing people, well, we, uh, I'm sure we've all heard, I'm sure everyone who's listening to this has heard that you have to hear something seven to 13 times before you can actually, you'll actually make a purchasing decision. Now, the, the propensity for buying the first time through is very high at a show comparatively to online, but you still are not gonna get most of the people. So if you're just expecting people the first time they see you to buy without having some strategy to keep connecting with them afterwards, like doing a mailing list, or something like that, it's, it's going to be very tough for you at a show. And if you don't have a, a book with a high margin, a high profit margin, it's going to be hard for you to do the next thing that you have to do to get to convince someone who's on the fence, which is to offer a discount. It's on the fence, I will offer them a discount. So a book for 30, I might do for 20 if they sign up for my mailing list. And I will say something along the lines of, all right, you really like this book, right? But you want to see everyone at this show? I'll bet you $10 you love that book. I will give you that book for $20 instead of 30 if you buy it now instead of later. And if you don't love it, you only spend 20 bucks on it. But if you do love it, you'll come back and buy more. And so I'm willing to make that gamble. And I can because I build in that profit margin and I build in that ability to make a deal into the pricing of my books. It's definitely a good tip. And uh, so you were talking earlier about there's artist alleys and then you can be on the ex exhibition hall floor as a vendor. Uh, generally speaking, what should, especially say uh, uh, someone who hasn't done it before, what, where should you be looking to get a spot? Like is artist alley best? Is it going to be clear if there is an author section, if you should be there? I don't like being in, so I like Artist Alley generally. Being on the, so there's a, again, this goes to buyer psychology, is when if you're on the main exhibit floor, people are there to spend a lot of money. So the people that are on the exhibit floor have a lot of money. Like, like they are there to, that's where, that's, those are the people that are spending the hundreds of dollars at a, at a, at a clip. I mean, they're going and buying corsets for $200 a pop or swords for $300 a pop. So you're gonna, the, the chance that you can spend make a lot more money on those people is higher, but man, you spend a lot of money to get there. In Artist Alley, you're spending considerably less money to get there. Um, and you can even cut that down by sharing a table. Now, not every convention is okay with, but most, especially if you're under like a similar banner, like let's say you have a press and all three of you are on that same press, even though you're all independent, you could all then be at one artist alley table. Alley tables that are spread out and not author centric because I mean, honestly, people are usually, it's very hard to sell a book at a convention. This is not, this is even my lowest selling products are books at conventions. And that is because it's very hard to make a visceral connection with an author in the moment. And so usually people with, where there's an actual author section have problems in that author section because it has the least traffic. 
But if you can connect with someone who's already walking down Artist Alley, you'll have a better experience because they're already Artist Alley are in the mindset to support local people. And they're in, the, they're in the mindset to spend maybe a little bit more to make a connection. And they're looking for things that are cool. So you wanna be in the place that has the highest traffic for the thing that you're trying to do. Just like with all marketing, sales are a function of how many people you talk to. And if there's, if there's, if there's not enough people coming down your aisle, I don't care what you do, you will not make enough money which is why author areas are tough. Artist alleys are very good depending on the shows. The vendor floors are best, but you are going to pay for it. I highly, highly recommend if you can to split your table with at least one other person. Do a bundle deal with somebody. For instance, if each of your books are $20, do two for 35. Because then you're both bringing audiences into each other's network you're going to have fans at the show. They're going to have fans at the show. I cannot tell you how much money I have made over the years by splitting tables with people. And they make money on my gut people because I am now introducing them to someone cool. And the reverse happens to me as well. And at the end of the day, we're making more money take home because instead of a $300 table, we're only spending $150. All right. <laughs> Plus, you get someone to talk to. <laughs> That's true. How many of these conventions have you been to? Uh, I mean, I, 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 I didn't count amazingly before last year, but in the last year, I've been to ninety. Two years, I've been to ninety. Before then, I, I'm almost sure that I've been over a hundred. With just attending shows and doing panels at shows, I've surely been over a hundred. But this year, I did forty-two. Last year, I did forty-six appearances. Nice. Of all types. And this goes everywhere from a small store signing to a library signing all the way up to San Diego Comic-Con. Nice. What's the one thing you were surprised to see after attending your first convention? Costumes, quantity of people attending, being exposed to that many super fans in one place? I was curious. How tired I was afterwards. <laughs> like that was like, the, it was, it's a very tiring experience. Because I've been going to shows since 2010 and signing at shows since 2011. So if you're talking about the very first time, I was surprised that I sold out. I was surprised that I bought 75 copies of books to San Diego Comic-Con and 75 people exchanged $5 for that single issue comic. And I, the next time I was that I tabled, it was in 2013 at San Diego Comic-Con and I did a signing and we brought 75 copies of a book at $20. And I was again surprised that I sold out. And the last show that I did, I am still surprised that I sold out. Every time, it's still really the same thing that surprises me, that people are willing to take money out of their wallet when they only have a finite to spend at a show. And of all the lessons that I've ever gotten from a show, looking somebody in the eye as they give me money and understanding that they are taking a piece of their life that they worked statistically too hard for, for too little money and money that they don't have. And they are exchanging it for a thing that I made. I don't have that same reaction when I do when I, like online because it's impersonal. But in the moment, you can see it in somebody's eyes when you connect with somebody and when they buy their book and when you exchange that like you, our souls resonate on the same frequency of weird. And this is a thing that I use all of the time. And I'm not a big woo-woo person, but I do believe this. I believe that I take a piece of my soul and I bind it in an object and then my job is to find people who resonate on that same frequency of weirdness and have their soul glow a little bit by looking at my thing. And I was surprised the first time somebody bought it, my book. And I am still surprised thousands of books later that people resonate with it. Some of these books have been out for years. The, the, that book that I did a first signing with, is Ichabod Jones Monster Hunter. So I've been selling this book on some frequencies since 2011 and that people still exchange 
a piece of their soul for it is incredible. And, and I don't visceral connection online. So it's always nice to be at a show sometimes where you can remind yourself that these are human beings who are more than just the $20 bill or the $3 bill or the $1 bill that they are giving you. They're giving you a piece of themselves because something you did resonated with them. All right. Uh, my next couple of questions is from one of our viewers by the name of Jin. She wants to know what extras do you put on your table? Bookmarks, giveaway draws to get email addresses, etc. So I used to do a giveaways at my table. What I would do it was, so if you want to do a giveaway at your table, it's a great way to build a mailing list. It will affect sales, but it is a great way to build a mailing list. And here's how you'd run a giveaway at your table. Take some amount of money and bound to vendors who you know are big sellers. And you ask them in your genre. So like, let's say, you're, let's say you have a horror book, Ichabod Jones Monster Hunter or you have a sci-fi book like Spaceship Broken, and you go to people who are selling a lot of something like prints or well, probably not bookmarks or keychains or something. And you go to four or five of them and you say, what is the best selling book at your table or thing at your table? And they tell you, and I like to say a caveat of maybe $10 or less. What is the best thing selling thing at your table for $10 or less? And they say that. And I say, I will take however many days of the show it is three days, two days, one day, I want that. And then you go to four different things and you put together a bundle just like you would online. And then you now know that the people, the, that people are interested in the thing that you're selling because the vendors have told you so. You know what the best selling item they have is what attracts them the most at this show. You construct a bundle at your table to do a giveaway that you can sign up for free. Again, just like you would do this online. However, you have to understand that it will cut your table sales in half because unless you are bringing a helper or onto the giveaway and you're going to have to talk to them to sign, to sign them up and you really need to have, so MailChimp has an offline sign up called MailChimp subscribe and you can, you can download it only on a tablet. It is free and you can have people do it digitally and it saved my butt more times than I could ever because people's handwriting is horrible and it's much easier to type. Um, as far as extras, I have done bookmarks. I've done special prints, um, all in exchange for emails. And so here's the secret to an email and why an email is so powerful. An email is powerful because it is the only thing online that you value. Besides maybe your personal Facebook page, it is the only thing that you value. And so I want to do something like give a free print away if you sign up for my mailing list. But I want it to be a really nice print, like something that people will really want, something, something that I might even price on my table at $5. But I'm going to give it to you for free because I value the thing that you're doing. I value your email address. And... By that, in, in that express showing that I have value, that I value the thing that they're doing, or even giving them a discount at the table, I'm valuing their email address and they're valuing what I'm doing by giving that to me. However, I will say now that I don't do most of those things. My friend told me a very ama an amazing strategy that has worked like gangbusters. When people ask me, do you have a card? I say, no, but I have an email address and I point them to the thing. Almost everybody signs up every time. They don't care about the card. The card's going to go away, but people that are actually interested are signing up for the mailing list. And the mail, if you join my mailing list, you get eight free books. Some of them are comic issues. Some of them are chapters. Some of them are full books. I figure if I can't convince you to sign up for get eight free things for me, you're never going to buy for me. And if you do sign up, I'm going to give you a discount for buying in the moment. So that is how I run my table. I've done everything at every price point. I have found that less is better than more for me. All right. And Jin has a follow-up question as well. She's asked, how do you get the eye contact some convention tables say is hard to get? So 
I have snapped at people. I have asked them questions <laughs> at my table. I have taken a thing that they that they have in their hand. So when people wear book bags, I'm like, hey, that's a cool book bag. I'd be ashamed if I filled it up with books. I have said um, hello to people. I have asked them questions when they look over at my table and said, uh, uh, so one of the best things you can do is ask them a question that is open-ended. Like, do you like, uh, that they can answer quickly, but it's kind of open-ended. Like, do you like monsters? What's your favorite monster? And then lead them down a branching decision tree that allows them to uh, make decisions very quickly and give these little yeses. So little yeses lead to a big yes. So if you can say, my brand is monsters. So like if I can say, do you like monsters? They say yes. And I said, do you like psychological monsters or fantastical monsters? And then they can keep making these decisions and keep giving me yeses. I can then show them the book that is most closely related to that thing. And they are more likely to buy it. If you are like Lindsay, a little more introverted, my friend has an amazing tip. Uh, she has bookmarks at her table and she will stand there and she will hold the bookmarks out and smile at people and give a little nod. And when they touch the bookmark, instead of releasing, she actually pulls them in before she releases. So she pulls them, she's very introverted, but this works really well for her. She puts the bookmark out, they take it, and she just gives it a little, I can't do this as gently as her, she just gives it a little tug. And then she lets it go, and she says, have you heard about my book yet? And they go, no, I haven't. And it's just very simple. They're, she's smiling, she's engaging, they're taking the bookmark, and then she's, she's almost forcing them to lean forward to take it, which is again, very psychological, but your physical positioning is very important for how you engage with something. So by having them lean forward a little bit, even if it's just a tiny tug, she gets them more engrossed. And then knowing that they're in their brand because they, she has big, beautiful like uh, bookmarks. And as they lean in, she says, have you heard about my book yet? Or would you like to hear about my book? And then she puts a book in their hand. This is another thing. When people have books in their hand, they are much more likely to buy. People do not like losing things or the idea of losing things. Once a book's in someone's hand, you've almost got the sale. All you have to do is make them connect with that piece. And also having a, a, some different things at the table. I wanna put this out because People love this sales tactic, and I'm good, I might forget later. I have this little USB drive, which is all of my books on it. Digital books. This USB drive has 10, 13 things at this point on it, and it just keeps going, and the price keeps going up. For people that do digital, or people that are like, I don't know if I just wanted to spend $20 on this one book, I say, do you do digital? Because I have this USB drive, and look at it's a very nice USB drive. It's uh, it's actually a B. It's silicone, so it's not like a cheap USB drive. It's nice, and I say it's a functional four gigabyte USB drive, so you can use it. It has all my books on it. You can get a sampler, and then all of the books are in EPUB, Mobi, PDF, and CVZ files where appropriate, and it allows people to get a little thing to go home with so they don't have to put this in a worry about putting this in a bag um, or in a packing it um, they get a sampler and i still am able to make a decent amount at that show from that customer All sorry right, i know yeah. that wasn't part of it <laughs> listening to this is making me so glad i can sell stuff online <laughs> it sounds really cool for some people but i'm just horrified by having to even if handing out the bookmark would uh, be like, no, no, I'm gonna go back to my little cave and just <laughs> interact through email. But well, I, you know, I, my friend is similar. My, my friend is is. I have a friend who is very antisocial, and she brought a salesperson. She hired a salesperson and brought them to the table to bring people in. And all she does is smile and nod, and is very pleasant back there when people talk to her. But. She has designed her booth in a way to be very attractive to people eye-catching. And then the, she has somebody who makes a percentage of sales. Um, and 
they are bring, are actually the people attracting people. So for people that are very, very introverted, that is that you might be able to employ. <laughs> there you go. And I think it's a lot of people too have this sort of distaste for the hard sell or even doing anything that might be perceived as that. I feel like that thing with the branching questions, I'm like, gosh, that was used on me the last time I went to Nogales for somebody trying to foist a blanket on me. So <laughs> I couldn't see myself doing that, but I'm definitely not all authors for sure. And I'm, I'm like I said at the beginning, I'm super excited that there are alternative ways to make a living as an author without having to rely completely on Amazon. Yeah, it's, I, I, so I have a couple of questions that I ask myself, really changed everything for me. And the, the two questions that I heard a friend of mine tell me was, do you think you're a good person? Uh, do you think the thing that you're doing can change lives? And I said yes to both. And he said, then you are morally obligated as a good person to tell as many people as possible to change as many lives as possible. And that stuck with me. It stuck with me. And so another thing that, and then another thing somebody said to me is, if somebody wants to buy your thing, you should let them. I said, well, I don't know, because I, I don't want, People do not believe that I'm not good at staff and traditionally not been good at sales, but I've only been very good at sales for a couple of years and horrible at sales for most of my life. Um, and those kind of things where I, I don't consider it a hard sell. Other people may consider it a hard sell. I, I don't, I, I consider it trying to find out what you want. So when I say, do you like mythological monsters or horrific monsters, and someone says, neither, I go, well, you're probably in the wrong place. But the good news is this show has a whole bunch of stuff that are perfect for everybody. And um, if someone says, I like fantastical monsters, I'm like, you should try this book. And then I tell them about it. I tell them why they would like it. I tell them, and I explain using the words that I know the right people will want to hear. And if they connect with me, then I offer, then I'm like, would you like to buy something? If they don't, I say, look, it's a big show, sign up for my mailing list, you get a bunch of free stuff, and then you could find me later. So there is a way to do this very hard. I've done very hard sales before, but there is a way to think about it and to switch your mindset where it's more about trying to find the right person to resonate with a project. And one of the great things about having a lot of different projects is I've been with a lot of different core audiences is I've been able to test out a lot. So while it's been horrible and miserable for Amazon sales, I mean, just so bad for Amazon sales. <laughs> what me was that if I wanted to do a mystery novel, this is the kind of person and this is how I, this is how I should talk. And these are the kind of questions that they like and horror and fantasy and sci-fi. And I was able to lead these people down a road and understand that if they didn't want to buy something, that's okay. Maybe they weren't in the right place now. Maybe they'll be in the right place in six months. Um, maybe they liked all of my books, but probably they like to focus on one. So, Yes, it is not the softest sell in the world. It's not sitting there smiling, having someone pick up a book and then say they want to buy it. Um, but there is a way to use both use these marketing tactics successfully without coming across as like, hey, you want to buy a thing? Buy a thing, buy a thing, and being incredibly like buyer heavy. All right, very good. And I'm just going to ask a couple, we'll have a couple more questions here since we're coming up on the hour or we're already at the hour. Um, actually, Jin asked in the chat, and I'm curious too, where is there like a master list online somewhere or how are you kind of compiling and deciding which conventions are worth your time to go to? Sure. So there is a, um, there is a, a, email, a email list called Connoisseurus. There's also one called Convention Scene. And there's a couple others that are actually, ConCon Con is another one, though you can actually plan your conventions. There's also some Facebook groups that deal specifically with conventions. Um, but I use mostly Connoisseurus. 
uh, and it is an email that's very good. It comes every Sunday and it will highlight the new things that are accepting applications. All right, cool. Uh, you've actually answered almost all of the questions that I had for the second half, so I will uh, collapse what I have left into one question as well. Um, you talked about how you can sort of build authority. We talk a lot about for nonfiction authors, it's very useful to build authority. And it seems like the, being the kind of person who goes to conventions and sells books at conventions helps you be the kind of person who goes to conventions and sells conventions. And you mentioned uh, moderating panels is a good way to sort of get into it. How do you sort of find a panel to moderate and anything like that? Like, how do you sort of get your foot in that door? Sure, so every convention has a, con has a programming director, or every big convention has a programming director. Usually, most medium and small conventions also have programming directors, but the biggest, uh, uh, and you just have to find who the programming director is. Honestly, it's usually programs at the show. But if you do the con if you contact just the contact person, they'll usually tell you. If you are become an exhibitor, almost all exhibitor, um, almost all exhibitor emails will eventually say panels are open. So the best way to moderate is to propose a panel usually at a smaller convention, usually with friends of yours who are in the local area who are also authors. That most people who are listening to this podcast know at least a couple of authors and can talk about something on a panel. And so it might be how to publish your first book. I've done panels that are like very newbie panels for like people how to publish your first book all the great thing about being an expert is all you have to do is ahead of somebody else the other thing that you can do is look at the list of vendors and artist alley people find them online and ask if they would like to be part of a panel if you know somebody who is a bigger name than you in the same local area ask them if they know anyone who'd be like to be part of a panel most people want to be part of a panel they just don't want to do the work of setting it up so if you are willing to do the work of setting up a panel, you'll probably get a lot of people who are going to be interested, especially if they are already at the show anyway. Because again, it's a great way. I make hundreds of dollars every time I have a panel because people follow me back to my table enough to make, make it successful. And if you do smaller cons, I actually have a back door on my website, which is a hire me page for panel convention organizers that I send to people that show every panel that I've done at every show. Um, but at the very beginning, I just recommend go to a local show, ask a local library if you can host a panel, ask a local library if you can, uh, or a, 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 a local bookstore if you could have a couple of people do in and do a talk, and then just use that at, to leverage the next thing. Alrighty, and let's see, if you've already answered, I think the last couple questions I have, so I have one final viewer question for you from uh, Kevin. He says, all joking aside, since he lives in LA, has you have you ever gotten a booth at the LA Festival of Books? He says there are tens of thousands of attendees there every year. Yeah, it's hundreds of thousands, actually. I, oh, did, yeah. I did the Festival of Books the year that it rained, the only year in the entire history of the Festival of Books that it rained. Um. Festival of Books is great. It is better for publicity than it is for sales. And But most publishers, uh, book publishers, don't go to many conventions. Like Random House goes to a couple of big ones. Uh, Macmillan goes to a couple of big ones. But they usually go to ALA, Book Expo, and these couple of, and uh, some international ones. But a lot of them do come to LA Festival of Books. And so you're, you might think, well, why should I get a table at LA Festival of Books if I could just go and talk to these people at LA Festival of Books? And one thing about being at LA Festival of Books or a show like it, ALA Book Expo, and having a table, thematic authority, you're not a convention person, you're an exhibitor. You can talk to the people at the show like a different kind of person. It almost buys you authority. By saying, oh, you spent $1,500 or $300 or $100 to get in this door. Now, instead of one of 90,000 people, you're one of a few thousand people. And you can walk around 
and meet publishers and meet other authors and talk to them in a different way because now you're not attendee and vendor, you're vendor and vendor. Um, so, but I would say that that giveaway thing we talked about, for sure, that is a better strategy at, at Festival of Books than trying to actually sell books because it is very, very hard to sell books at LA Festival of Books, especially because people are usually giving it away. So I recommend going with like a big collective group of people because those tables are like $1,500. All right, excellent advice. And even though I'm not in a hurry to run out and do this, like I said, I'm so excited to hear about people being author entrepreneurs and doing this another way than just always worrying about like, oh, what are the, what are the Amazon algorithms doing this week? So I really appreciate, appreciate you coming on and talking to us about this this week. And I guess in wrap up, do you have anything? Are you working on any projects now? Or um, I saw on your website too that you're available as a speaker. Is that kind of something you do while at some of these conventions, or is that independent? Um, I I do it at conventions. I do it by myself. What I'm really excited about is I have a new course launching, but it is available now, and I'll make it available to your audience if they would like it. Called Sell More Cool Things. It's how to build your perfect client avatar, build the perfect product for them, build a funnel that will be able to make them know, like, and trust you, and then scale that funnel into infinitum. Now this can be done online and in person, but it's everything I learned from my podcast. And it is the implementation guide for sell your soul, how to build a creative, your creative career. When I launched that book, Oh my God, so many people email me with questions or how to implement it or that they were overwhelmed. And so I decided to spend the last big launch of my career coming, uh, not career, but of the year coming up with a massive course that can basically walk someone from doing to getting in the, to, uh, I don't know how to sell to by the end, they're like dominating their mailing list and they're dominating uh, doing sales in whatever way they choose. So I recommend though, you know, sell uh, either sell more cool things. There's a 20 minute video, which is everything you need to know about selling without feeling gross about it. Or my book, sell your soul, how to build your creative career. Cause I truly believe that sales are not gross. Most people think about sales and implement sales is very, very gross. So, um, that, that sell more cool things or go sell your soul.com for the book. And then next year, I'm so excited to be launching my first actual fantasy series, a three book series, hopefully in March, uh, which is the, which is um, Katrina hates the dead, which is my most popular graphic novel novelized and then two sequels. So I'm super excited because space fantasy and fantasy from listening to your podcast and a bunch of other podcasts and such. Like I finally narrowed down what I wanted to do and this whole year was just figure, like actually implementing the plan to do less shows and sell more online because I am just fascinated with how people make money on Amazon. Yeah, and there's other <laughs> it's nice when it just kind of happens in your sleep and uh, you're not you don't have to be out there hustling or, or traveling a lot too. I imagine that would be a little wearying if you're doing 40, 50 weeks out of the year. Yeah, but it's one thing that I will say is the shows, while they are wearying, for the first two to three years of doing a show, like you get exponential growth. Like I only have really two books on my table. You can't make a living on Amazon with two books. Like it's just, it's almost, I mean, I guess you could, but it's very, very hard. A show I'm able to, with pretty much two, sometimes up to four titles on a table, I'm able to make a very good living. So, and in Los Angeles. So I would say that once you start getting a big back catalog and Amazon will make sense, 10, 15 books on when you have some series and you can do all of the strategies is great, but shows are amazing because they allow you to meet your audience and make money in the short term while you're preparing for the long term. 
you know, that shows are an amazing long-term strategy because you age and as you age, I can't do the same things I did three years ago. Like I can't bring books to 40 shows a year. It's too tiring. But at that beginning when you were full of energy and vim and vigor, really nothing that I would recommend more than doing a show because if nothing else, it will allow you to meet your audience and know what they want and how to deliver it to them. All right, cool. I really appreciate all the advice this evening. And would you say your uh, video and stuff again one more time? And I will put it in the show notes here. will sure. be episode 20 160. Sure. The 20 minute video is at sellmorecoolthings.com. And then the book, the go sell your soul.com will take you right to the Amazon link for where to buy it. All right, cool. And I uh, look forward to seeing you getting your trilogy out next year or maybe more. So <laughs> hope that goes well and I hope you continue to do well at the conventions. Thank you for Thank coming you. on, Russell. Nice to meet you, Russell. Thanks for all the info. Thank you. I will so, say now I'm curious as hell to ch go check out one of these Comic Cons just to see what it's <laughs> like. <laughs> all right, see you, everybody. See ya. <laughs>